Different organizations organize their human resources in different ways. Learning what these ways are and what impacts organizational structures is the main point of this class. There are four parts in this class and the last part is for higher level students only. In the first part we'll discuss the key terms that will help us to build a foundation to understand an organizational structures. In the second part we'll learn different types of organization charts. In the third part we'll see how external environment impacts organizational structures and in part four for higher level students only we'll discuss change in more detail. Please remember that it's not about listening to what I'm saying and then forgetting it. It, it's about learning certain skills. So take a moment to have a look at these assessment objectives and try to understand what we're actually trying to learn here. Even though the title of the class is Organizational Structure, we're not going to talk about organizational structures right away. First, we will discuss some key terms to help us build some background knowledge in order to deepen our understanding of organizational structures. <laughs> The first term is delegation. Delegation is entrusting of or passing on of certain responsibilities and tasks from managers to their subordinates. Simply speaking, it means managers are given tasks to their subordinates, who can also be managers in turn and give tasks to their subordinates. Delegation is not a reward. Delegation is as natural to organizations as air to our planet. You don't reward people with air, right? Air is something that is natural, that exists on this planet. So same thing for, with delegation. It's something that is essential and completely natural to all organizations. Delegation is a win-win situation. So for managers, they don't have to do all the tasks on their own. They can spend more time on strategic decision-making, on something aimed at the long term. And for employees, for subordinates, in return, they are delegated with some interested and meaningful tasks. Hopefully. That's not always the case, but that's what it's supposed to be. The second term is span of control. Span of control is the number of subordinates that are directly accountable to a their line manager. Simply speaking, this is a number of employees under a manager. As you can see in the picture, span of control can be wide and narrow. In the first picture, this yellow box is a line manager and his or her span of control is two because there are only two employees accountable to that manager. And in the second picture, span of control is seven because this manager has seven subordinates. Wide span of control is not better than narrow span of control and narrow span of control is not better than wide span of control. They are just different and they have different features. Wide span of controls have fewer layers, lower managerial costs, effective communication, large teams and they can be hard to control. And narrow spans of control can have more layers, they're more costly because there are increased administrative costs. In addition, organizations with narrow span of control have prolonged communication because there are several levels in the hierarchy. However, they are easier to control because there are less employees accountable to each manager. And the chances of us and them culture are quite high. So with regards to us and them culture, this is something that is not cool in my opinion. Uh, this kind of culture exists when employees call themselves us and they call managers them and managers call themselves us and they call employees them. So it creates some sort of division. It means that there is no unity among subordinates and managers. It means that they see each other as some sort of opponents, as people from different tribes. <laughs> they do not feel themselves as part of one team. So organizations that have narrow span of control, they usually tend to get taller and they have a lot of administrators, which creates this sense of us and them. The third term here is levels of hierarchy. First of all, hierarchy is an organizational system that is based on ranking. It means that people on the top of the hierarchy have higher ranking and people in the lower levels of the hierarchy have lower ranking. They are subordinates to, what, to the ones that are higher in the hierarchy. In hierarchical system, line manager is a person who is in charge of certain subordinates. Line managers are not only on one level, they can be on several levels in a company. Okay, so anyone who is in charge of certain people is a line manager in an organization. Traditional hierarchical systems with levels of hierarchy, they create a sense of belonging and they are really easy and clear to understand. However, on the other hand, traditional hierarchical systems, they create some sort of division between departments. 
because people know that I'm in this part of the hierarchy and they are in that part of the hierarchy and we are kinda not really related. People do not consider themselves as part of one big team. In addition to that, when employees know their place in the hierarchy, organization tends to become quite inflexible, because people are not ready to substitute for each other, because why would they do a job of someone who is in a different department or in a different level of hierarchy? On this picture you can see an example of traditional hierarchical culture with one, two, three, four, five, five levels of hierarchy. So line manager of these three green guys would be these blue guy and the line manager of this blue box is this yellow box and guess who is the line manager for these three light blue boxes correct the green manager the next term is chain of command chain of command is a system by which orders are passed down in an organization simply speaking chain of command is how orders go down in an organization from the top management to the lower level subordinates in this picture you can see the chain of command in between the ceo the red box and the lower level subordinate all the other connecting lines are also chains of command. I just highlighted one of them in order to facilitate the understanding of what chain of command is. So basically all connecting lines in between all levels and all employees is chain of command. Apparently the more levels there are in the hierarchy, the longer the chain of command is, which means that it might take longer times for decisions to be implemented because they have to go down the entire hierarchy. At the same time, from another perspective, if there is a request from lower level subordinates, it might take a very long time to get an answer from the senior management. So the two adjectives that you can use to describe chain of command is long and short. The next term is bureaucracy, and simply speaking, bureaucracy is having to deal with a lot of procedures, with a lot of paperwork, that when there is like a procedure, a rule for every situation, when you cannot just take initiative and do whatever you want. The good and fancy definition of bureaucracy would be the execution of tasks that are guided by excessively complicated administrative rules and procedures. It refers to filling in the reports, tedious paperwork, long chains of command, formality, impersonal attitudes, high degree of accountability. Even though it sounds a bit terrible, it doesn't mean that bureaucracy is always good. However, bureaucracy doesn't always mean that this is order. And the opposite of bureaucracy, ad hocracy, doesn't mean that it's always chaos, okay? Bureaucracy is not order, ad hocracy is not chaos. It's just different ways to run an organization. However, what we can know for sure is that businesses that have some sort of creation among their core activities, some creative industries, for example, for them, bureaucracy really hinders creativity and limits risk taking. So what we know for sure is that bureaucracy is not suitable for creative industries. However, it might work very well for other types of organizations. The next two terms are centralization and decentralization. Both of these terms refer to decision making. In centralized organizations, decision making is in the hands of a small group of people or one person only. In decentralized organization, decision making is transferred, it's spread among many people or many groups of people. Let's talk about good stuff for centralized organizations. Centralized organizations make really quick decisions. One person or one group of people make a decision and everyone else follows. That's it. It works very well for crisis management when you need quick decisions. Also, it gives people a sense of direction. They always know what they are supposed to do. And in addition to that, centralized organizations are easier to control in a way because they are usually vertical and hierarchical. However, centralized organizations put pressure on decision makers because they have to make all the decisions in the company. So centralized organizations can be a little bit demotivating because you know that you are not part of any decision making, your word doesn't matter, you just do what you are told to do. In addition to that, getting things done may actually take a lot of time because in centralized organization you need to wait for your boss to OK you on something and before you get that OK, you are not allowed to proceed with the task, so it might be quite time consuming. Decentralized organizations are quite the opposite of centralized. They are motivating, right, because you feel that you are part of decision making. So you are empowered to make the decisions. So workforce employees are usually more engaged and motivated. 
in decentralized organizations. However, since there are more decision makers, it means that you need more managers, which means you need to pay higher salaries and your administrative costs will be higher because you have more administrators, more decision makers. In addition to that, it's quite hard to control decentralized organizations because there are so many decision makers and you can potentially lose control of the entire organization if you give too much power to everyone. So centralized is not better than decentralized and decentralized is not better for centralized. Different kinds of organizations work better in different situations. The next term is the layering. Delayering means the removal of the entire management level in the hierarchy, as you can see in the picture. So we have the dark blue level of management here, we remove them, and in stage 3 we have one layer less. However, it doesn't mean that these four guys are removed from the organization. They might go to upper levels or lower levels. They don't have to be dismissed. What happens when you delayer your organizational structure? Good thing and bad thing happens. For good stuff, you reduce administrative costs. You remove the entire level of managers, which means that your administrative costs will decrease. Also, what happens to chain of command? It shortens, which means that communication becomes shorter, easier, more direct. In addition to that, since you removed the entire levels of people who manage and control and supervise, delegation will increase in empowerment and decision-making among the higher and lower levels will also increase, so workforce might be more motivated. On the other hand, when you remove the entire level of management, it might create some sort of insecurity among employees, because they do not know who their manager is and they don't know if they will have to do more job or maybe things will change, and as you remember from the previous class, change is scary. In addition to that, when you delayer the management level, it doesn't mean that you necessarily delayer the work that they were supposed to do. This work does not just vanish in the air, it goes to upper and lower levels of the hierarchy. In addition to that, imagine we remove the layer of management, right, and these people used to make decisions. Who makes these decisions now? The subordinates, the other people will have to make these decisions, which means that the number of decision makers might potentially increase, which comes with certain delay in decision making. Term number nine is matrix structure. In order to understand it, you'd better have a look at the picture. Here you can see a hierarchical structure and matrix structure which is within the hierarchical structure. So as you can see here we have a traditional hierarchy and if this hierarchical organization decides to start some sort of project, developing a new app or designing a new marketing campaign or developing a new product or anything else, and they might need people from different departments and different levels of hierarchy and all of them need to be connected and work together in a team, that would be matrix structure. So these red connecting lines within hierarchical structure would refer to matrix structure. The opposite of matrix structure is hierarchical structure or functional structure. However, matrix and functional structures can coexist, just like in the pictures that I've just shown you. Very often, matrix structures are common for project-based work. Project-based work is when human resources are not organized around departments, but when they are organized around certain projects, among one-of-a-kind activities. And then when project is complete, you disassemble the team and then you can reassemble it again for a different project. For this type of work, matrix structures are really common. Higher level students will talk more about project-based organizations in part 4 of this class. In the second part of class, we are learning different types of organization charts, we are learning to analyze them, and at the same time we are learning to draw them. So even though this part of class is called organization chart, you should understand that chart is just a picture. It's a picture that represents organizational structure. So even though we're learning chart, indirectly, implicitly, we are learning organizational structures. So once again, chart is a picture, a graph, a diagram, a scheme that represents organizational structure. Organizational structure is the whole thing that describes all the professional relations within an organization. By professional relations, I mean who is the boss, who is accountable to the boss, who works in this department, who works in that department, and all sorts of relationships within a company. All the arrangement of human resources. This is organizational structure. And chart is the picture that represents organizational structure in order to make it easy to understand. 
What organization charts actually show, or what the two main things within an organizational structure, is accountability and responsibility. Accountability is an upwards relationship. So, I'm a teacher in my school, I am accountable to the principal, he is my boss, okay? So, I am accountable to him. This is an upwards relationship, because my boss is on the top of the hierarchy. Responsibility is a downwards relationship. Responsibility is what my boss does. He is responsible for all teachers in the school, right? So, accountability upwards, to be accountable to someone. Responsibility is downwards, to be responsible for someone. Here you can see a picture of a traditional hierarchical organization chart with CEO, with four directors of four departments that correspond to the main business functions with different managers and supervisors and lower level subordinates. By the way, it doesn't have to be four departments. There are four business functions, but it doesn't mean that all organizations only have four departments. They can have two, one, three, ten, twelve, etc. However, the four business functions always stay within an organization. They can't disappear. But number of departments does not have to correspond to the number of functions. If you forgot what business functions are, please review 1.1. So why actually draw organization chart, if you can just understand an organizational structure in your head? Because organization chart makes it easy to understand many things by just looking at it. Some of the things that you can see from organization charts are functional departments, right here. See, from organization chart you can see that there are four departments in this organization. You can see chain of command, if CEO wants to get something done by lower level subordinates, it takes one, two, three, four levels to go down. Span of control. You can see span of control of absolutely every single person in an organization. For example, the blue manager span of control is two, but these guys span of control is three, and these guys span of control is zero. So you can see span of control of absolutely every member of staff of organization. Communication channels. Communication can be horizontal between employees of the same level and vertical. Vertical can be upwards and downwards. Again, you can see all the potential ways of communication from organization chart. And finally, you can see levels of hierarchy that we learned in the first part of class. And in this very picture, there are one, two, three, four, five. Five levels of hierarchy. So these are some of the things that you can see from organization charts. In addition to that, for employees it creates a sense of belonging, because they know like, oh, okay, I'm right here, this is my job, I'm accountable to this one, I'm responsible for these guys, and it makes it easy to understand who you are within an organization. There are several types of organization charts, which means that there are also different types of organization structures, because, as I mentioned earlier, chart is just a picture that represents structure, right? So, in order to make it easier for you to understand, I broke down organization charts into two main categories. One is by height, because organization charts can have different height, right? And another category is by purpose. Purpose means what the organization chart is trying to show. If we're talking about the first category, height, then there are two types of organization charts. Tall or vertical and flat or horizontal. With regards to the second category, there are three types of charts by product, by region, and by function. First of all, let's talk about the first category, by height. Here we'll compare flat or horizontal and vertical or tall organization charts. Keep in mind that you can either say tall or vertical, both are fine. Or you can say horizontal and flat, both are fine. You can use them interchangeably, whatever sounds better to your ear. We are going to use nine different criteria to compare flat and horizontal organization charts. Honestly, I think that understanding the differences between tall and vertical structures is pretty easy, and I have created nine criteria for you to compare them. Maybe you can just pause the video and have a look at this table, and uh, if there is a question, please let me know in the comments below. Have a look! I'll just take this opportunity to remind you what us and them culture is, because I think it's really important. As I mentioned in the first part of class, us and them culture exists when subordinates and managers do not consider themselves part of the same team. Managers say we or us about themselves, and they say them about their subordinates. Same thing for subordinates. 
for people who are under managers. They say us about themselves and them about managers. Personally, I think that us and them culture is not cool because it creates division among people within an organization, which is supposed to work as one big team. In addition to that, I want to elaborate on the last point. Flat horizontal structures are more suitable for creative industries because if there are a lot of layers of managers and you need to ask for permission for everything, creatives cannot work this way. They need some risk taking, they need some freedom for decision making and for creativity. Bureaucratic, tall, hierarchical structures with many levels are not suitable for creative industries. However, when it comes to crisis management, when you need one person or one group of people to make a decision and the rest of the organization to follow, then this is perfect. Tall structures are perfect for crisis management. You make a decision, everyone follows. As you remember, the second category of organization charts is purpose. Purpose means what the chart is trying to show, around what the structure is organized. It can be organized around three things – product, function, or region. Let me give you some examples. We're going to use Yum Brands as an example of our organization chart by product. So Yum Brands has several products, has several brands, for example, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, and KFC. Chart by function is the most traditional one, the most common one, when businesses are organized, are structured around the business function that they perform. For example, there is XYZ Limited in imaginary company and there are four departments, four functions – marketing, production, finance and HR. The third type of chart is by region. By region does not always have to refer to real geographical area. For example, IB organization, IBO, sees the world as three regions, not five continents, but three regions, which are Asia-Pacific, Africa, Europe and Middle East and Americas. Again, these charts or these structures, they serve different purposes. Human resources are organized among different things. Keep in mind that they don't have to contradict each other. It doesn't have to be one kind of structure or one type of organization chart. They can all exist together. For example, in Yum Brands, under each product, there can be a traditional hierarchical chart by function. Reminder, chart represents structure. We learned charts and structures. So it means two things. Thing number one, you can use these words by function, by product, by region, flat, tall, horizontal, vertical, not only about charts, but also about structures. And the second thing is that these are just names to describe different ways to organize human resources. It means that one organization can organize its human resources in a certain way. You can use different charts, different types of structures to explain one and the same organization. So these are just different ways to express how human resources can be organized within an organization. One more thing before I finish this part of class is matrix structures. It's very clear how to draw a tall chart, how to draw a flat chart, how to draw a chart by function, by product or by region, but how to draw a matrix chart, matrix organization chart. Here there is no one rule, because matrix structures are really complicated and they depend on different situations. One thing you can do in order to practice understanding of matrix structures is to imagine, I'm just saying imagine, that you are a very very bad student <laughs> and that teachers and administrators are trying to create a project where they will try to help you to study better. So you can take the traditional hierarchical chart of your school and you can highlight or circle the teachers or administrators within this hierarchy who will work on helping you to study better project, okay? And that would be a matrix structure for you only. Have fun drawing different types of organization charts. In part three of this class, the most important thing is understanding the assessment objective. So, as you've just seen from the title, this assessment objective is discuss the appropriateness of different organizational structures given change in external factors, AO3, which means evaluation. So, there are three key words in this assessment objective. They are structures, external, and change. First, let's break down this objective and talk about these three key words. The first one is structures. You already know several structures. 
hierarchical or functional structure, matrix structure, tall or vertical, flat or horizontal, by region, by function, by product. Higher level students in part 4 of this class will learn two more kinds of structures, project-based and shamrock. So this is what structure is. The second keyword is external, external factors or external environment. This refers to anything that's going on outside the business but impacts the business. There is a business tool in Business Management Toolkit that is called Steeple Analysis. This tool helps you to evaluate, to understand the external environment and see how it impacts decision making within your organization. So you will learn this tool in more detail in Business Management Toolkit, but now I'm just going to say that Steeple refers to seven factors, which are social, technological, economic, environmental, political, legal, and ethical. So all of these factors, in addition to anything that doesn't fall under, under any category, refers to external environment and it impacts businesses. The third key word is change. Change is one of the four key concepts of the IB Business Management course, and again, we'll talk about it in a different class. For now, think about change as an alteration or modification of the current working practices. So, now we've broken down the assessment objective, have a look at it again. Discuss the appropriateness of different organizational structures given change in external factors. Does it make more sense now? Now, attentive students might say, okay, I understand all three parts. I understand structures, I understand change, I understand external environment, but how do I discuss the appropriateness of structures? So, this is how you discuss the appropriateness of structures. There are several factors or criteria or ideas or points of argument that you can use to discuss the appropriateness of this of that structure. So let's say an organizational structure of organization ABC XYZ is turning from tall and vertical to flat and horizontal. Discuss the appropriateness of this horizontal structure. So you might need to discuss the appropriateness of the new flat structure in terms of the following things. First of all, in terms of slap. SLAP is a universal rule that applies to pretty much all AO3 questions. You should talk to your teacher, your teacher should know very well what AO3 is and what SLAP is, I think. <laughs> so SLAP refers to stakeholders, long-term and short-term implications, advantages and disadvantages, and priorities. The secret here is to analyze the appropriateness of different structures in terms of these factors in a balanced way. Balanced way means on the one hand, on the other hand. In addition to SLAP factors, you can analyze appropriateness of different structures in terms of communication, sustainability, leadership, costs, or anything else that comes to your mind that you think is relevant. What's important here is that you can explain a. why this criteria, this factor is important, why we should analyze the appropriateness in terms of this factor. b. Your analysis should be balanced, which means that it's not one-sided, like, yeah, this structure is great because blah blah blah. You should be balanced. On the one hand, it's great because of this. On the other hand, it's great because of that. And C, you should also justify your arguments and use facts from the case study and refer to real-life examples in your answer. Again, this type of thing is something that is better done in the classroom and your teacher should know what AO3 is and how to help you with evaluation. For now, I just wanted to give you some ideas. I hope this table is very useful. Feel free to screenshot this table and share it with your friends. Hello higher level students, this class is exclusive, it's for you only, but if you are a standard level student, I'm not gonna tell anyone, you can stay as well. So the objective of this class is to discuss changes in organizational structures, but the content of this class is project-based organizations and shamrock organizations. You might ask, how does change in organization structures refer to these two types of organizations only? There will be an answer a bit later, please be patient. First, let's see what project-based and shamrock is. Once we understand this, we'll get into the discussion of change in organization structures. Project-based organization, as I mentioned briefly in the first part of class, is a type of organization where human resources are organized around projects, not around product, not around function, 
but around projects. It means that there are different teams of different people from different levels of hierarchy and different departments who work together on a certain project, and when the project is done, the team is dissembled. Team can be reassembled again for the next project, or there can be several projects at the same time. So hierarchy doesn't really matter here, product doesn't really matter here. They do matter, but they are of secondary importance. What's important for how to organize, how to structure an organization is project. That's why it's called project-based organization. Project-based organization is not the same as matrix structure, but they can overlap. Very often they do overlap. What you need to understand is that matrix structure is a characteristic of a structure, and project-based organization is a characteristic of the organization that arranges its human resources around projects. Some examples of project-based organizations could be IT companies. Your goal is to create a product, to develop an app, or to develop a video game. Once it's done, that's it, you're good to start the next project. Or construction is a perfect example. The project is to construct a building. Once building is done, project is over. Then you can build another building, but that would be a different project. So hierarchy does matter, product does matter, region might matter as well. But the most important thing is the project. In this picture, you can see XYZ Limited, which organizes its HR around functions. And in this picture, you can see project-based organization ABC Limited, which organizes its human resources around projects. Keep in mind that those two do not have to be the opposites, they can coexist. And matrix structure is like a link between project-based organization and hierarchical functional organization. So the person who designed this theory of Shamrock organization is Charles Handy. He is very important to business management, he specializes in organizational behavior, and you will see his name later when we learn motivation. And it's not the last time I'm mentioning Charles Handy. So anyway, he is Irish, and I'm guessing that Shamrock organization was inspired by Ireland in a way, because Shamrock is one of the main symbols of Ireland. Anyway, Shamrock organization is a type of structure that divides human resources into three leaves, into three groups or categories, right? Depending on how important, on how essential they are to the core activities of the organization. So the most important leaf in this shamrock is core staff. Core staff is irreplaceable people. Usually it's CEO, engineers, it's directors, it's people who have to work in the company and make decisions they cannot be external to the company. If we are talking about film production, imagine who is core staff? Director, cameraman and uh, actors, right? Without them, film production is impossible. The second leaf of this shamrock is outsourced workers or contractual workers. They perform tasks that are still very important, but that can be delegated, outsourced to an external company. If we talk about film industry again, then 3D effects are usually outsourced to other companies. You cannot outsource actors, you cannot outsource the director, it's just impossible, makes no sense. But such things as visual effects, even though they're still very important, you can let another company do it for you. You can outsource it to your subcontractors. And the last, and if I may say so, the least important leaf of this shamrock is peripheral stuff or temporary staff. This refers to people that are only hired on a temporary basis. They usually work part-time. So if we're talking about amusement parks, usually their peak season is in the summer. More people go to amusement parks in the summer, so they need more employees. So they might hire some students who are on vacation just for a few months to help them out. That would be an example of temporary staff. I hope Mr. Handy will forgive me for drawing this. I do it only out of respect. I think it looks cool. I think Mr. Handy is a real boss of organizational behavior. And Shamrock organization is another new way to look at organization by dividing all the human resources into three categories, into three leaves of one Shamrock. Now back to the objective. Objective doesn't even have project based and shamrock in its name, right? It says discuss the changes in organizational structures. So how does it relate? Why did we learn project based and shamrock when we were supposed to discuss the changes? This is how it relates to it. Organizations nowadays tend to get flatter 
more horizontal, chain of command tends to get shorter, span of control tends to get higher, and more and more organizations are becoming project-based, and more and more organizations think of themselves from Shamrock organization perspective. They think that they do not need to build a hierarchy and hire all the stuff full-time, right? You can divide it into three groups, or you can only get people to work on projects, and this is the kind of change that many businesses nowadays go through. So the objective is to discuss this change, to discuss how organizations change from hierarchical structures to shamrock organizations, or to horizontal or flat organizations, or to project-based organizations. When organizations go through this change, go through this transition, it comes with certain implications. Implications can be either positive and negative, and this is exactly the thing that you need to discuss, these implications. If you want to discuss these implications, then have a look at what we learned in the second part of this class, and you can see the features of flat or horizontal organizational structures. So these features are the implications that organizations go through when they change to flatter structures. Actually, it might go either way. I'm sure that it's not really common, but some flatter horizontal organizations might get more vertical or tall, right? In order to discuss these implications, see the features of taller organizational structures and you'll be able to discuss the implications of this change. Also keep in mind that project-based and shamrock organizations is another way to see organizational structure and to describe it not based on the hierarchy or function, but based on the activity, project, or based on the importance to the key decision-making. I'm talking about shamrock organization now. Oh, and don't forget to have a look at the assessment objective of this class and think if you have achieved all of these or not.